Hello, my name is Nikolai Yusupov, and in this video I'm going to show you how to utilize your BVM properly. Far too many times when we do skills in the lab, I see this device being used inappropriately, and you're going to think, well, BVM, such a simple device, how can you go wrong? Well, guess what? There's different components, and different manufacturers uh, make different designs. So I'm going to go over with you uh, with the basic uh, Ambu bag and another device that's made here by Life Support Products and you'll notice uh, they're made differently and they have different components. So let's start with the Ambu bag or uh, single-use resuscitator um, and here I have a brand new one uh, and this is a pediatric version and I want to open a brand new one to go over some of the components that will be important to note. Note that the pediatric or one that I'm holding in my hands is exactly the same as this adult MB bag. So the first thing that I want to point your attention when I open the bag, right, what I want to take out is this component here, and this is called manufacturer's instructions. Now, you don't want to do this at the bedside of a crashing patient, a patient who is dying, but whenever you get a new device, before you're gonna use it in the field, you wanna look through the manufacturer's instructions and look at all the components that this device has, and more importantly, how to employ it, right? Far too many times, you think you will take this out and figure this out as you go, and chances are, uh, you're making a lot of mistakes if you don't consult with the manufacturer's guidelines. If your device does not have them included, please go to the manufacturer's website. You could easily download the PDFs for all the devices here. Now, as I open this device, you notice, as I open this up, now we have an oxygen connection here that goes to the reservoir back. However, there's another port here that you see here. And far too many times I see students when we're doing a lab, when we have to intubate and pre someone, they will connect their oxygen source to this port here. So what is this port for? So this port is used for medication administration. It's a med administration port. And the adult version has the same port on this end. Uh, and the reason why I bring this up, even though this is a mat port for this device, on this manufacturer, this is no longer a mat port. This is used for manometer reading. So this one, you will connect to a device and it will tell you when you squeeze the bag, what's your pick inspiratory pressure. So now, as right off the bat, you see that each manufacturer has different components on their devices. So and another uh, way, the way I know that this is the oxygen port and this is not the oxygen port is a simple test. When I connect my oxygen tubing to an uh, oxygen source, what do you suspect that is going to happen? Well, I suspect I will have inflation of what? Of my reservoir bag. So now the way I test this out is I connect this like so and we set our flow rate at about 15 liters per minute. All right, and you notice the reservoir bag inflates. And this tells me right away that when I squeeze the bag, right, I'm es essentially using this oxygen that will be pulled into this device and to the patient. Same way, if I connect this device to an adult version, you will see my reservoir bag inflate. Now, if I made a mistake and I happen to connect it to the medication port, even though even though oxygen is coming in through here, whenever you squeeze the bag, you're not entraining any oxygen to the patient, right? So the importance of all this is to connect your uh, device per the manufacturer's guidelines. The next factor that I want to mention here, right? So. What else does this device have, have to offer us? So after you get the oxygen correctly placed, let's, let's, let me show you the actual medication port. So what type of uh, device can you use for the SMAT port? So ideally, right, this is used with the endotracheal tube, the tube that I have, that I have here. So medication flow will be administered through the endotracheal tube. Now, you will say, well, why, why do you have a glove here? Well, the reason why I have a glove here is first, before I give you the medication administration demo, I want to show you uh, this side port here. So if I remove this port, this is essentially a splash guard to protect you from any uh, regurgitation that the patient may have. So if I remove this splash guard, uh, this portion here is removable. And the reason it's removable is in cases when you're ventilating a patient and let's say 
they are to vomit and a lot of gastric content is coming up right through the airway and may, it may clog your BVM as it's going up into the BVM. What you can do is instead of getting a new BVM, you can then screw this part, right? And what you can do is then go ahead, squeeze your bag and get all the uh, vomit out of, of your BVM, right? So as you squeeze, hopefully if anything was clogged here, it will be removed. Then you could replace so this device and screw back. But now I removed, I removed my splash guard. And what this offers me to do is this allows me to place a peep valve. And what is a peep valve for? So a peep valve is for the following reason. So this is why I have a test lung here. If you notice, when I squeeze my lung, when I stop squeezing, it deflates. So pretend this is your alveoli. When I squeeze it, they inflate. And when I let go, they deflate. But the moment I introduce a peep valve, and uh, peep valve stands for positive and expiratory pressure, the moment I squeeze it, you notice my alveoli, or test lung in this case, does not deflate when I release. And I can set this pressure between 5 and 20 centimeters of water pressure by dialing this dial. So this is a peep valve, same thing as a CPAP, a continuous positive airway pressure. So this is exerting positive and expiratory pressure upon exhalation. So you will say, well, what's the purpose? Why do I need this device? So the purpose of this device, if you're trying to pre the patient, and with all your efforts, with good mask seal, two-handed, uh, triple airway maneuver, you still cannot get their set uh, up above 90. So that means they probably have some sort of a shunt physiology. Shunt physiology means they may have uh, pneumonia or pulmonary edema, that even though the blood flow is good through the alveoli, because it's consolidated, right, it's collapsed, there's no diffusion of gases that are occurring. So by employing a peep valve, I can now distend the alveoli open every time I ventilate the patient and I can recruit more alveoli units so that I will have matching of uh, ventilation, perfusion, and diffusion at that time. So PEEP valve is used for those patients who, with all your attempts, you couldn't get the set above 90, and they usually have some sort of a shunt physiology, uh, which is a pneumonia or pulmonary edema that precludes good uh, exchange of gases. Right? So this is what I'm going to use this for. Now, the moment I take this off, you will see, right, it will deflate fully because I'm no longer applying PEEP. So now we went over this component. There's another component here that I will take off. So here for this manufacturer, this is a manometer reading. So what's a manometer? Um, manometer, you place this device here. Every time I squeeze the back, I get real time feedback. What's my peak inspiratory pressure in the airway? So how hard I'm squeezing the back and resistance that I'm meeting in the proximal area of the patient. So I will have a little gauge that will tell me this, right? And for this manufacturer, right, as I said, this is for manometer reading for here. So for this guy, you will place a manometer on this port. For, for this ambu bag, you will place it here. So this is um, what it's intended to be for. Now, next, next step. Here, I have something known as 40 uh, centimeters of water pressure pop off valve. That means that when I, when, I, when I meet resistance and I exceed 40 centimeters of water pressure, this thing will distend, it will open up so that I cannot entrain any more air. But I can override it. I can close this clamp up and it will now preclude, right? It will prevent it from opening up. So I can exceed 40 centimeters of water pressure. And you will say, well, when do you want this? Well, sometimes for pediatric, especially um, um, that those who have, let's say, obstruction of the airway and you, you're coming in, right? And you're trying to ventilate and you're trying to relieve that foreign body weight obstruction. Sometimes you are unable, you are unable to um, get it out, right? So we, you are taught to utilize a laryngoscope blade and then a tracheal tube to essentially push it forward. So in those cases, you may need to exceed that 40 centimeters of water pressure to do this. On very little neonates, small bags, they may be used when they have meconium aspiration. So it will be, you, will re, you will meet resistance. And two, in those neonates, uh, their lungs are not fully expanded because they just came out of the womb, right? So you, they will have high pressure in the lungs. So you may need to override that high pressure. Right? So now that we've gone over this, uh, so it's a safety mechanism, we've gone over PEEP, we've gone over oxygen, the last thing left is administration of medication. So I'm going to remove my, uh, my lung that I made it as my demo, and once I do this, 
you have an exposure, right, of the endotracheal tube. So here, this is how we're going to employ the medication port. And pediatrics, the American Heart Association, still allows you to give medications via endotracheal tube. So epinephrine is routinely given uh, for pediatrics at 0.1 milligrams per kilogram, even though this may not be the optimal route to administer this medication. Right, you still are able to do it. So how are you going to employ it? So first of all, if you have a low lock system, right? If you, let's say, either you have a Bristol jet or you drew up your medication into a syringe, you can open up this med port like so, and you have a lower lock. Lower lock means there's no needle. I'll just screw this on like so. And by screwing this on, I can now go ahead and push my medication. So if this was my pre-measured epi, you will see that I have a container here that will catch my fluid. So I will direct it down and I'm going to go ahead and push. And you see fluid comes out, right? So if your medication, if you gave your medication, you would follow it with a flush. Now let's say you did not have a lure lock system and you had a, a system that had a needle at the, at, the, at the top, right? So here I have a Bristol jet. This is an old way of doing this. Most systems now have a lure lock, but if you had this epi, you could still administer it by keeping this med port on, you will inject your needle here, and then same way you will push your medication, pre the calculated dose, and for the pediatric we utilize a Braslow tape, right? And you will see the medication will come out through my tip of the endotracheal tube, and you're going to follow it up with a flush, right, to essentially get it uh, into the system. Now, this will go in a sharps container uh, after you're done with it, uh, and the reason why I bring all these things up is that I do not like to hear students uh, verbalize skills in the lab. So they'll say, okay, I will oxygenate the patient and they will not actually connect it to the oxygen and they will verbally say, okay, uh, I have connected it and they will go through the motions of ventilating. But when you actually start doing the skills and what I start seeing is instead of connecting your oxygen source here, the oxygen source gets connected through this port here, you have now are not following manufacturer's guidelines. And uh, the reason why it's important to not verbalize skill is that if you perform this in the lab, I can correct you. I will tell you, right, this is the port for the oxygen. So let's get that out of there and place it in the proper location. And this is the port for the medication administration. So if you are not verbalizing your skills in the skills lab, I can easily correct your mistakes. If you already passed that point uh, that you're in the field as an independent provider, before you start to figure this out on your own, look at the manufacturer's guidelines, ideally not at the bedside of a crushing patient, and consult them, see how and what components is for and for all your devices. And once you are comfortable with that, practice, right? So open one of the devices and perhaps get an end service from your training officer and go through all the components, connect everything, see how it works, because you do not want to be trying to figure this out, again, at the bedside of a patient who is in cardiac arrest and a patient who is crushing.